I had an extremely uh, strange road trip for me anyway uh, the last couple of days. My children have been down in Georgia for the last week with my parents, and uh, we decided that the best way to get them home was for my parents to drive to Roanoke with the children, for me to drive to Roanoke and meet them there and turn around and drive back. So that was Friday and Saturday, a lot of windshield time. And uh, um, that's not all bad news because on my way down to Virginia on Friday, I happened to be listening to the radio And I happened to find a lady that some of you will know, a lady named Jill Tarter, uh, who was talking on the TED Radio Hour. She's an astrophysicist who directed the SETI Institute, which looks for other forms of life in the universe. And in her talk, she said, we, earthlings, we are made out of stardust. Now, some of you already will dismiss the rest of this quote because of that uh, first few words. This is, this is only for people who go and worship at Mount Shasta and that sort of thing. No, no, no. no. Uh, Jill Tarter is a very accomplished scientist. She said, we are made out of stardust. The iron in the hemoglobin molecules in the blood in your right hand came from a star that blew up about 8 billion years ago. And the iron in your left hand came from another star. We are made out of stardust. Later in that same hour, I heard Brian Green from Columbia University say that it's not just possible, but maybe it's probable that a multiverse exists. Not a universe, but a multiverse Many, many universes making up a multiverse. That the math supports that idea. Whose math? I have no idea. I couldn't possibly tell you. I'm just saying Brian Greene's math supports a multiverse. The idea means that, in his mind at least, there is something, something that makes up our existence that looks like bubbles in a bubble bath. Lots of different universes attached to one another. And that thanks to the theory of relativity, when you stand outside of those bubbles in the bubble bath, they do not look like they are changing shape or expanding or contracting. But when you are inside them, they do. I don't get it either. What we know is that there are possibly 100 octillion stars in the universe, or in our universe anyway, that there are 10 trillion galaxies, 200 billion stars in the Milky Way alone. And I don't know about you, but when I hear such things and chew on them for a while and wonder about all the random things that have happened to me, I I start to feel a little unmoored, imperfect things that have happened in my life in their own way that have happened in a perfectly crafted universe or maybe multiverse, that my pieces of stardust that are perhaps 8 billion years old, what they've seen, what they've they've been through, I wonder as I wander about these seemingly random things that have just happened in my life, my little life here on this one planet, among seven billion of us, these things that have just happened, and my life seemingly could have taken an entirely different course if something else had happened. The moment, the moment when my parents said, we're moving to the United States as opposed to Australia or South Africa or some other place. What if, what if I was two inches taller or two inches shorter? What if I had brown eyes rather than blue? What if my parents had not hugged me at a particular time? What if, what if I hadn't been a resident advisor on the same staff as the woman who would become my spouse? What if I had gone to law school instead of seminary? What if my fourth grade math teacher had become decidedly more compelling than my freshman year religion professor in college? 
What if you, what if you had looked at that man just the other day with empathy rather than irritation? What if, what if you just the other day had given that woman a moment instead of rushing by? We here today live within a varying willingness to entertain such what ifs. We cannot live for what ifs alone, but the The whole idea or notion or maybe reality of a multiverse awakes me from my slumber even momentarily to suggest something. I have no idea what it suggests, but it suggests something that perhaps perhaps a story, a story is unfolding and a story is being told to me and to you. Why did God say that? When we look at the Bible, that's a question that many of us have. Why did God say that? Why did God do this? I sometimes ask it as well. What is the point of that? And the problem with that question is that it can leave us all tied up in knots. And that in the journey of faith, we come to realize with time and experience and probing and prodding and nurturing that a better question may well be, why did people find it important to tell that story? Why did people find it important to tell this story? Stanton Morg. In 1993, my family rode through the same part of Virginia that I was just in yesterday, Stanton. My children and I stopped at the Waffle House in Stanton yesterday. But anyway, in 1993, my family and I were traveling through the Shenandoah Valley doing the Blue Ridge Parkway thing, Woodrow Wilson's history thing. And we stayed at a motel. And we were lucky enough to have two rooms, one for the parents and one for the kids. And so my parents said, as we were going to bed that night, just give us a call in the morning, dial the extension for our room, and we'll, we'll get it together and go eat breakfast. And so my parents were staying in room 12, and I hit one, two on the phone, and it rang twice, and then I heard on the other end, Stanton Morgue. And I hung up. I said to my sisters, I just called the morgue. How is that even possible? So my sister, Katie, said, just call the number again. One, two, Stanton Morgue. And I said, it's the same person at the morgue. And then I hear a chuckle on the other end. My father (laughs) saying, how how did you think you called an outside number by dialing one, two? What's the matter with you? (laughs) And so while we were at the Waffle House in Stanton yesterday, for about the sixth time, my son said to me, Tell me that story about when you were in that hotel with Granddad. And that reveals a number of things. What is it that that story is telling my son? What is it that that story is telling me? That my dad, Ben's granddad, can be funny. Um, But also that even as we were pranked, my sisters and I felt like we could trust our parents or that Maybe it's just that our parents trusted in their own abilities as parents for such a prank to not eternally disturb their children. What does it say about someone that thinks it's funny to pretend they work at a morgue? I have no idea. But when my children ask me to tell them a story, it is implied in their request that they wonder not just which story I will tell, but what I am trying to say when I am telling it. Why is it important for him to tell me this story? As I hear Ephesians 6, some parts of that set of verses take me to an uncomfortable place. A place where I, I heard a lot of much more conservative theology that I'm now used to and being flung my way. A way where there was only one right way to do things and and lots and lots of wrong ways to do things. And frequently I found myself doing the wrong things, apparently. Some of you may relate to that. And so 
So today, as someone who is a person of faith, I ask of the sacred texts, why are you telling me this story? And also, as a father, I look at these texts and I wonder, as I look at my children, in what way should I communicate this story to them? What is it that they want to hear communicated? What, it is, what is it that I am communicating? What was it that I was communicating when, just a few minutes ago, we sang that hymn, A Mighty Fortress, by Martin Luther, who composed it in 1529? I have some, some issues with that hymn theologically. I don't even like the tune that much, I have to confess. But did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing, Luther wrote about 500 years ago. Our striving would be losing. In Ephesus, things were not particularly easy for the people. And that is very clear It's also clear that Paul lived among the church in Ephesus at some point, and for him it was an important base of operations from which people were sent to go do missionary work. Ephesus was an important town for the Greeks and the Romans too, a place of great architectural importance, a place that was likely to be full of people who would scoff at the notion that Jesus was anything particularly special. It was a place where Caesar was the son of God where the cosmic forces that were in play were wrapped up in the morals and behavior and dictates of the Roman gods. It was a place of learning and culture, a place that was one of many jewels in the empire's crown. Christians such as they were, were not a big group, not a big group at all. But what they said and did, these early followers, was and is very interesting. Those early Christians, they said things that were incredibly revolutionary, very countercultural. They said crazy things like, you know what, Caesar isn't the son of God. They said that mercy rather than violence was a virtue. That the very nature of the armor that is described in Ephesians 6 was uh, offered to them in connection to righteousness and faith. That in Ephesians 6, the message couldn't have been a message of smiting their neighbors. It was for them as an oppressed minority, a way of trying to figure out how to survive, how to withstand that being a minority, how to stand up for themselves, how to speak truth to power in a way that allowed them to, to do so with integrity and humility and humanity and faith. Our author in Ephesians speaks to truth-telling and prayer Truth-telling and prayer is an oppressed minority. He's trying to tell us something about the reappropriation of violent symbols. He is trying to take the elements of a soldier's garb, the language of war, and reappropriate them for purposes more in line with understanding what it looks like to live with great difficulty and oppression in the first century. And for the people in Ephesus at that time, Their striving would be losing, our author seems to say. Their striving would be losing if they are interested in magnifying their own egos rather than God's goodness and grace. Our writer reminds us that the temptation to put on real armor and fight was very real for the people in this church. And yet for the Ephesians, if they were to do that, then their striving would be losing. That to fight to actually fight with their fists and swords and shields would to be comp- would to, to compromise their ideals and their call it would be to compromise their place as children of god their striving would be losing to fight would mean further repression further difficulty their striving would be losing This passage in Ephesians 6 opens up all sorts of possibilities for understanding how our striving would be and can be and has been losing. That many of the structures we implement or stumble into have winners and losers. National identity, that thing that gives us so much pride some of the time, can be a wonderful thing, a wonderful way in which we can rally together. It provides for a a sense of belonging and yet... Our striving would be losing. 
The walls that we build between nations have been devastating in other ways. It is, it is a brilliant thing how we have mined the earth for resources and yet our striving would be losing. The manner in which our vehicles are fueled has been on the one hand a stunning example of human ingenuity, an enormous success, and on the other hand, on the other hand, our striving has been losing. And so our, remi- our writer in Ephesians reminds us, we remind ourselves that in the, in the church in Ephesus, that when they got down to it, when they came together as this oppressed minority and worshipped together, that their corporate life would be full of liturgy that included prayer, reading, singing, speaking, greeting, passing the peace, repeating the actions of Jesus. They would say with great frequency when they worship together in remembrance of him. Let us together turn the other cheek in remembrance of him. Let us love our enemies in remembrance of him. Let us offer bread and wine together in remembrance of him. Let us worship in remembrance of they had, they had a story. And it wasn't the only story. But it was a story that they clung to. Stardust. Stardust. Eight billion year old stardust in your blood. Universe or multiverse. Randomness. Chance. Meaningful, designed encounters, what ifs, what ifs, stories, your story, his story, her story, belonging, virtue, choice, order, randomness. What does winning look like? What does it look like to have a life that is worth living? No easy answers. How am I to be a parent? What am I to do today? Daddy. Daddy, tell me that story. Tell me that story of Stanton and the morgue. Daddy, tell me that story. Tell me that story of belonging. Daddy, tell me that story of faith. Daddy, tell me that story of virtue. Daddy, tell me a story about my place in the world. Do this, my son. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen.